Hi, and welcome to the Google Gum Electronics Baseline Pick C tutorials. In this first lesson, we'll take a look at a couple of the smallest, simplest picks, and we'll start the traditional way by blinking an LED. These videos are intended to be a companion to the Baseline Pick tutorials, which are available as a free download from the Google Gum Electronics website. They go into more detail than is possible in the video lessons, so it's best to download the tutorials, pause these videos whenever you want, and refer to the written lessons to fill in any gaps. To program picks, you'll need a development environment, what they call a tool chain. Setting up the core development tools is covered in the introductory videos, but briefly, in these tutorials, we'll be using the MPLAB X IDE, and we'll run it under Windows, but you should be able to follow along just fine if you're using Linux or a Mac. The Pickkit 3 Programmer, and the Gulagum Baseline Pick Training Board. And to program in C, you'll also need a C compiler. There are a few available. We'll be using Microchip's X68 compiler, which is a commercial product, but we'll be running it in free mode. In free mode, some optimizations are disabled, so it generates bigger, slower code. But for most purposes, it's perfectly fine, as we'll see. To download the latest version of X68, go to microchip.com. As you can see, I'm making this video at the start of 2018, and Microchip might have moved things around since. But at this point in time, the XC compilers are under design support, development tools, software tools for PICs, XC compilers. Then go find the XC8 compiler for your system under the Downloads tab, and download it. When you run it, sign your life away to Microchip, then select the free license type. Now it's next, next, next. And after the install is finished, you're given a chance to try a free trial of the Pro license. But there's really no need, so you can just hit next again to finish. XC8 is installed. Before we use it though, we'll start by taking a look at the simplest pick there is. A 10 of 200. We can't go into all the details in the video. As I said before, you should refer to the written lessons for that. But the ultimate reference for any pick is a data sheet, which you can download from microchip.com. Sometimes the data sheets contain errors, but even if you're working from tutorials, you should consult the data sheet as well. Data sheets often cover a few devices. In this case, the 10 of 200, 202, 204, and 206. They're all variants of the basic 10 of 200, with extra memory or features. To keep it as simple as possible, we'll work with the 10 of 200. It's available in a 6-pin surface mount package, but it's also available in an 8-pin dip package, which is a lot easier to prototype with. It's still a 6-pin chip underneath, so two of the pins are not connected. There are also power, which can be up to 5.5 volts, and ground pins, leaving four available for general purpose I.O. They connect to the things the pick is responding to or controlling, and they're named GP0 to GP3. The nice thing about programming in C is you don't need to know all the gory details of the pick's internal architecture. The compiler hides a lot of it from you, so don't let this diagram scare you. But you should know that modern picks, such as the 10 of 200, contain flash memory, which holds the program code that the pick is running, and that your program can read and write data memory locations called registers. Special function registers provide access to the I.O. pins. The PIC's internal status and other functions we'll look at later. The PIC also has a small amount of RAM, where the C compiler will place your program's variables and data. But note that the contents of RAM are lost when the PIC loses power. The I.O. pins can be set up to be either inputs or outputs. Well, most of them anyway. GP3 can only be an input. It can instead be configured as the reset pin, also known as MCLR. Pull it low, then high again, and the pick resets itself. Almost the same as if you turn the power off, then on again. The GPIO register gives you direct access to the I.O. pins. If a pin is configured as an output, that pin will be driven high if the corresponding bit in GPIO is set to 1. Clearing a GPIO bit to 0 will drive the corresponding pin low. So, for example, if GP1 has been configured as an output pin, setting the GP1 bit to 1 will drive the GP1 bit high. By default, the pins all start out as inputs. 
That's to avoid damaging anything connected to them before you've had a chance to set things up. To configure a pin as an output, clear the corresponding bit in the TRIS register, which is also known as TRIS GPIO. So, to light our LED, we need to connect it to one of the I pins, clear the corresponding TRIS bit to make that pin an output, and set the corresponding bit in the GPIO register to make that pin go high. Here's the circuit for this example. It's pretty simple, eh? Just power the pick from a 5 volt supply, add a decoupling capacitor on the power supply, and drive the LED directly from one of the output pins via a current limiting resistor. To build this circuit with the training board, just insert the 10F200 supplied with the training board into the 10F socket. Taking care to plug it in with the notch toward the top of the board, and close the jumper next to the LED labelled GP1. Every other jumper should be left open. Plug the PIC kit 3 into the training board and connect it to a USB port in your computer. The PIC kit 3 will supply power to the board, so that's all the hardware setup for this lesson. Now we're ready to write our first PIC program. When you first run MPLAB X, you'll see the start page. Here you can access a lot of useful information, but since we're starting a new project, we'll click on Create New under Projects. This will run the new project wizard, which, as you'd expect, helps you set up your new project. We're making a simple piece of code that will stand on its own, so we'll choose Standalone Project. Next we specify which device we'll be programming. We're using a baseline pick, so select the baseline family, and then the specific device, which in this case is a 10F200. Some picks can be debugged through a piece of hardware, called a debug header. But we're not doing hardware debugging in this lesson, so we can ignore the debug header option. Now we need to tell MPLAB what programmer we're using. If your pick kit 3 is plugged in, it should show up in this list, identified by its serial number. That's pretty handy if you have more than one pick kit 3 plugged in, but I've only got the one, so I'll select it. We also need to tell MPLAB which compiler to use. I've got an old high-tech C compiler installed, along with the MPASM assembler, which comes with MPLAB X. You should also see the XC8 compiler, which we installed earlier, listed here. We'll be using XC8, so I'll select that. The final step is to name your project, and specify where it will be stored. I'll give it a snappy name, and then go find the directory I created when I downloaded the tutorials. By default, MPLABX creates a separate .x folder for its project files, unless you select otherwise. I think it's needed to keep the MPLAB files separate, so I'll keep the default. And, since we only have one project, I'll select it as the main, and only, project. After you click Finish, the project will appear in the Projects tab. It's where you can access all the files, such as source code, that belong to your project. Source files contain the code that's compiled by the compiler. So we need to create at least one source file for each C program. You could just type them in from scratch, but luckily Microchip provides templates that you can use as a starting point. A convenient way to create a new C source file is to right-click on Source Files, and choose New, and then Main.C. Type in a suitable file name, leaving out the .c because the extension is added automatically for you. You can place the new source file in a specific folder if you want, but I'll just leave it blank, so the file will be created in the projects folder, which is where you'd usually want it. The file is now listed under source files, and it's opened for editing in an editor window. But before editing the file, I want to set up the editor to work the way I want. So I'll go to Tools, Options, Editor, then the Formatting tab. Check the language is set to C, and select your preferred formatting style, and customise it however you want. Personally, I like ANSI style, with a tab size set to 4, but your mileage may vary. Now let's start writing some code. The first section of the template code is a block of comments, which I'll expand on a bit, dividing it into sections. Of course, 
how you comment your program is up to you. Date and version number might be a bit redundant if you're using a version control system such as Git, but I fill them in anyway. I also document what processor this program is written for, even though it's not hard to run the code on another PIC, because the C compiler takes care of a lot of the low level details. Speaking of compilers, it's also a good idea to specify which compiler this program is written for, because code intended for one compiler won't necessarily compile on another. Files required can be useful in a bigger project, so you can keep track of what this program depends on, although MPLAB will keep all of a project's files together, so you don't really need to document what files are required. What is really important though, is to say what the program does. I usually include a short description, then some more detail. In this first example, we'll only turn on the LED. We'll flash it later. It's also important that you document which pick pins are used for what. We'll try to write code that makes it easier to change the pin assignments later, but they still have to be documented. XC8 programs should always start by including the XC.h header which defines the symbols which make it possible to refer to the PIC registers, such as GPIO, by name. The template now jumps straight to the main program code, but there's an important bit missing. The PIC has to be configured by setting up the configuration bits, which are sometimes called fuses, which specify how the processor should be configured before any code starts running. You could go and look up the data sheets and type in what are known as configuration pragmas yourself, but there's an easier way. Get MPLAB to generate the configuration code for you. From the window menu, select Pick Memory Views, Configuration Bits. Here you'll see all the configuration options applicable to your processor. If you ever move your code to another PIC, you should repeat this step, because different PICs have different configuration options. Master Clear Enable means the GP3 pin will be configured as an external reset, so it can't be used as an input pin. We don't need any input pins, so I'll leave the MCLR pin enabled. Code protection is intended to make it difficult for anyone to read your code out of the PIC. We're not doing anything secret here though, so I'll leave code protection off. The watchdog timer can be used to automatically restart your program if it crashes. We don't need that feature, although we will use it in a later lesson, so I'll disable the watchdog timer for now. Once you've selected the configuration you want, click the Generate Source Code to Output button. MPLAB will generate the appropriate pragma statements, complete with the descriptive comments which you can copy and paste into your code. Pretty easy, eh? I'll just add a couple more comments. Now we're ready to take a look at the main program, which I'll reformat a little, because I like to keep my braces aligned. As usual for C, the main part of your program sits in a function called main. When the pick starts up, it executes the compiler's initialization code, then it runs the main function. But unlike bigger computers, there's no operating system. Nothing calls main. If your program finishes, there's nowhere for it to go. Nothing to pass control back to. So this return statement is a bit misleading. There's nothing to return to. So I'll get rid of it. Instead, your program will usually perform some initialization tasks and then go into a loop which never finishes, which is normally called the main loop. So simple PIC programs are usually structured like this. Now let's add some code to turn on the LED. Remember that the LED is connected between GP1 and ground, so we need to drive GP1 high to turn the LED on. First, we need to configure GP1 as an output pin. That means clearing bit 1, because it's GP1, of the TRIS register. XC8 makes it possible to access the PIC's special function registers, including TRIS, through variables defined in header files. They're included automatically, so you don't need to be aware of the details. But if you want to check how the register variable is named, you'll find the headers in the include folder under the XC8 installation. The symbols for the 10F200 are defined in PIC 10F200.h. So, to load the trist register with a value, you can use an assignment statement, like this. We only need to specify 4 bits, because the 10 of 200 only has 4 I.O. pins. The bits are numbered from bit 0 on the right, so you can see that bit 1 is being loaded with a 0 here. The other bits are all 1s. Now that we've configured GP1 as an output, 
we can make it go high by writing a 1 to bit 1 of the GPIO register. And we can do that by assigning a binary value with bit 1 set to GPIO, turning on the LED. If you prefer, you could use the left shift operator to make it clear you're writing a 1 to bit 1. But in this case, I prefer to write it as a binary constant. And that's it. We don't need to do anything in the main loop. Just sit there looping forever until the power is turned off. Now we've finished our program, we need to compile it and load the compiled code into the PIC. But before the PIC can be programmed, it has to be powered. You could supply power through the DC jack on the training board, but there's no need to do that. The PIC at 3 can supply enough power. So first, we need to configure the PIC at 3 to supply the power. Your project status is shown in the dashboard window. It shows what device you're programming, what compiler you're using, the tool you're using to program would debug the PIC, and how much of the PIC's memory is being used by your program. Or it would, if it was enabled. So I'll click here to enable memory usage reporting, because it's very useful to be able to see if you're running out of memory. To configure the PIC Kit 3, click on the Project Properties icon, which opens the Project Properties window, where you can change the tools you're using, or, like we want to do here, just change an option or two. We want the PIC Kit 3 to supply power, so select PIC Kit 3 in the category tree, then the power options. We want to power the target circuit, so I'll select that, and 5 volts should be fine, so I won't change the voltage. But you'll see later that selecting a slightly lower voltage here would have been better. Compiling your program is called building the project, and you can do that through menus or keyboard shortcuts, or you can just click on one of the hammer icons. The hammer builds your project. This process leaves intermediate files behind, which can save some time when the project is next built. The icon with the brush cleans out those files first, and then builds everything again from scratch. There's usually no need to do that though. The icon with the downward arrow loads your program into the PIC. It automatically builds the project first, so usually you just make some changes to your code, then you click this icon. An MPLA will build the project, and if your program compiles without errors, it will load it into the PIC, all in one operation. Or, you can click on the run icon to run your program. First it builds your project, then programs it into the PIC, then starts it running. Same as what the program button does. Either way, it's one click to build, program and run. But so you can see what's happening, I'll just click the build button to start with. You can see the compiler output in the output window. The code compiled without errors. Now that the code compiles OK, I'll try programming it into the PIC. I'll simply click on the Make and Program Device button to do that. First, MPLA has to check it's not about to fry the PIC. MPLA knows that the 10F200 can handle 5 volts, but a lot of PICs can't, so it's checking to make sure we've got a 10F200 connected, not some other device before it goes ahead. We don't need to keep seeing this message, so I'll tell it not to show again. My PIC at 3 now attempts to power the training board, but it fails. It reports that it can only supply 4.75 volts. If this happens to you, no problem. 4.75 volts is plenty. So I'll just go back and configure the Picket 3 to supply that. When I try making program again, Picket 3 powers the training board successfully, programs the pick, and our program starts running. The LED lit. Okay, not very brightly, but it did light. That's great, but we really wanted to blink that LED, not just light it. Before we change the code, let's start a new project. There's no need to start again from scratch though. You'll often want to base a new project on something you've done before. It's pretty easy to do. Just right click on the project and select copy. Type in a new project name, and if you want, you can make a new folder for it. But I prefer to keep all the projects first session together, so I won't change the folder. The new project appears in the Projects window, alongside the old one. 
But we don't need the old project anymore, so just right click it and close it. Don't delete it, just close it, so it doesn't appear in the projects window. When you expand the new project, you'll see the source file still has the same name as before. But that's easily fixed. Just right click it, select rename, and type in the new name. Don't worry about the .c part, that's done for you automatically. If you now double click the new source file, you see a copy of our turn on LED code from before. Before adding any code to make the LED flash, I'll update the comments. In this example, the LED will flash once a second and will stay on for 20% of the time. We're using the same pick as before and it's configured the same way, so there's no need to change the configuration. And the LED is still connected to the GP1 pin, which has to be configured as an output, so I can keep this initialization statement. Now we just have to turn GP1 on, then off, then on, then off, and so on. So I'll move the turn on statement into the main loop. And follow it with a statement that clears GP1, turning the LED off. Okay, but I'll make the LED flash way too fast to see. Looks like it's continuously on. We need to add some delays. And luckily, XC8 provides some delay functions. Well, actually, they're macros, but you use them like functions. But before XC8 can generate the appropriate delay code, it has to know how fast the pick is running. The 10F200 is always clocked at 4 MHz, so there are no options there. We have to define this crystal frequency symbol, even though the 10F200 doesn't use a crystal oscillator, as 4 million. Now we can use the delay MS macro to delay some number of milliseconds. We'll turn the LED on for 200 milliseconds, then off for 800 milliseconds, and so on forever. When I build this new project, the LED flashes. Okay, that's pretty good. But what if, instead of using one statement to turn the LED on, and another to turn it off, we wanted to use a single statement to toggle GP1 from on to off, or off to on, in other words, to flip a bit. But first, I'll make a new project for this and update the comments again, really quickly. XC8 makes it really easy to work with individual bits, or collections of bits, called bit fields, through structures defined in the header files. The definitions look a bit complicated, but they're actually quite simple to use. For example, you can access GP1 is GPIO bits dot GP1. By the way, you can see here that MPLAB offers a list of C structure elements for you to choose as you type, and it can be set up to show documentation on the fly. So we could turn on the LED with a statement like this, and off with another statement like this. That's a bit clearer, eh? To toggle GP1, you could use the complement operator to set it to the opposite of whatever it was, and then just make the delay 500 milliseconds, and we've got a loop that toggles GP1 every 500 milliseconds, flashing the LED once a second. That's pretty straightforward, and on more advanced picks, we'd be pretty much done. But on baseline picks, you need to worry about something called the read modify write problem. You see, when an instruction reads a port register, such as GPIO, it's reading the actual state of the pins. The problem is that even though the pick is trying to make an output go high or low, there might be something external, stopping the output from actually changing as expected. Maybe the pins externally forced high or low, or maybe some capacitance makes the output voltage change slowly. So, when the pick writes a 1 to a pin, maybe it's been loaded down and reads back as a 0. 
or maybe it reads as a zero straight away. But after some time, it would read as a one. Either way, you can't assume that a statement like this will actually toggle the output, because what it reads from the pin mightn't be what it last wrote to that pin. Now, 99% of the time you'd be fine, but that 1% can be a killer, especially in production hardware. The solution is to write to what's called a shadow variable, which is just a copy of what the output should be. Your code should update the shadow, then copy it to GPIO. That way, your code never tries to read an output pin, but only ever writes to it. So we we'll declare sgpio to use as a shadow copy of gpio. Instead of toggling GP1 directly, we toggle bit1 of the shadow variable. And to toggle a bit, you get an exclusive ORIT with 1. So we do that, then copy the updated shadow port value to the actual port, GPIO. It's not too complicated really, it's just a bit annoying to have to use shadow copies like this. When I build this version, the LED starts flashing with a 50% duty cycle. In the next lesson, we'll move up to a slightly bigger pick and see how to read a push button switch and debounce it. See you then.